and you know, here in New England, you know, we think of you know, maple trees, uh, we think of honey, uh, but you know, other than, a, than that, uh, you're not really gonna find any natural sources of sweetness. Part of the reason why the apple has been so successful is its natural sweetness. Um, and that has helped its journey. Um, obviously with seeds and, and trying to spread seeds, you know, being sweet gives you an advantage thinking about it from the plant's perspective, um, you know, you're more likely to get consumed and then, you know, later deposited in a distant field. And of course, uh, for plants, getting your seed as far away as possible um, is the best case scenario. You don't want to create co competition right down the street. Um, you want to send it far away. So for the apple, um, its uh, sweetness is one of its greatest advantages. So the apple, um, as we know it, actually uh, originated in Kazakhstan, um, in Central Asia, uh, which is sort of crazy if this is the first time you're, you're hearing about this because you think of apples as being so American, uh, American as apple pie, but they're anything but American. Um, so Kazakhstan um, is sort of where uh, the apple is home. And if you get a chance to visit Kazakhstan, which I haven't, it's on my bucket list, um, this is a picture of, of Kazakhstan to the, to the right. Um, and if you get a chance to visit Kazakhstan, uh, you won't see Malus domestica, which is the apple tree that you see in my backyard and in your backyard. Uh, you will see Malus uh, silversi, um, which is the, uh, the wild cultivar, the wild type of apple, um, of what we know as the apple. Um, so at some point there had to be a transition from Malus silversi um, to Mal Malus domestica, um, and sweetness was key to that. Um, so we're going to talk about that. But if you go to Kazakhstan, you will encounter forests of Malus silversi, um, and it's there's sort of this broad, uh, you know, spectrum of fruit that you will encounter in these wild forests with hundreds and thousands of different varieties of apples, many of which you won't encounter anywhere else. Um, and that's one of the strengths of, this, of, the, of the species is its ability to create variants within its population. Um, and it's, it's really, really fascinating. So that sweetness um, drew uh, humans to cultivate the plant, uh, both for food, um, for feed and for alcohol. Um, and so uh, that was a, a major incentive uh, to domesticate this plant. So in Kazakhstan, you'll find Malus silversi uh, but the rest of the world, Malus domestica. Uh, it left Kazakhstan and made its way to China uh, via the Silk Road. Um, and then once in China, uh, it was able to spread around the world. Um, so that was its journey. Um, now, 19th and 20th century, we've sort of fast forward a little bit, um, brought some significant uh, improvements to propagation practices. And we'll talk about propagation and, and kind of what changed over time. But you have to remember that for most of human history, uh, we didn't really understand uh, sexual reproduction in plants. Uh, and so we were propagating this plant by seed, uh, which we'll talk about why that's not the best thing to do um, in a few minutes. Uh, so 19th and 20th century, we started seeing advancements in horticultural practices and were able to um, you know, really start cultivating this plant for production um, widespread. Uh, but in the meantime, it had already become a, a sort of a, a, a horticultural zealot um, and made its way around uh, the entire planet um, in terms of, of, of culture, especially in Western culture. Um, of course, everybody knows about the Garden of, of Eden reference and that apple um, and that, that sort of sinister uh, thing that it's supposed to represent. Um, and, you know, <laughs> And of course, the reality is, is it probably wasn't an apple. Uh, it was more likely a pomegranate uh, because apples don't grow in the Middle East, uh, not without significant irrigation uh, <laughs> um, and some, some climate control. Um, so chances are, if it was anything, it, it would have been a pomegranate. But, um, you know, all the way to Johnny Appleseed, which is, you know, of course, everybody knows the story. Uh, but of course, uh, what's interesting with Johnny Appleseed is uh, his name was, was uh, Johnny Chapman, um, and Johnny Chapman was a real person um, who, uh, 1770s, 70s, 80s, um, 
you know, was sort of known for traveling uh, around the countryside, um, planting apple trees um, and making his way west. Um, he became very wealthy, uh, basically selling uh, apple seedlings. Of course, they were all planted from seed because he, he didn't know any better. Um, so the, you know, the apples that he sold, who knows what they would have been, um, but he made his way into a folklore um, as sort of the all-American guy, a uh, true capitalist, um, and, uh, and one of our earliest horticulturalists in terms of, of folklore. So uh, very interesting, uh, the progression that apples have made uh, over time. And of course, there's Johnny Appleseed himself. He's a very handsome fellow uh, in this rendering of him. Um, he was known for walking around barefoot as well. Um, so I encourage you to, to read, read into that. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting anecdotes um, behind his story. So propagation is one of the, when it comes to the apple, is, is one of the more interesting things. Um, and a lot of folks have questions about this um, and sort of, you know, how to propagate apples. And, you know, if I plant an apple, if I plant a seed from an apple, what will that look like? Um, so plants are great. We'll just sort of start high level. They have two paths that they can take for propagation, uh, sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. The easiest way to explain that would be if I cut off my arm, uh, I cannot grow a new me uh, from that arm. Um, so, uh, and I don't need to give you an example of the, of the sexual propagation. So, um, so yeah, so plants have the opportunity to do both. Um, apples demonstrate uh, this extreme heterozygosy, um, which basically means that they, um, they, in terms of reproduction, are working towards maximum uh, diversity in terms of the type of fruit that they, they produce. Um, so there's a couple of key things to remember about them. One is that they are able to produce fruit without cross-pollination. Um, so that's just one thing that's sort of built into the apple uh, to encourage that diversity. So when we plant apples um, intentionally, uh, we plant at least two cultivars, two varieties um, in a space in order to have that cross-pollination. Um, there are other uh, fruits um, that do that, but um, I think peaches might be, no, I'm sorry. I think it would be pears would be another example. Um, but for the most part, uh, apples need that cross-pollination. Uh, so we plant more than two or more varieties in one space. Um, and then the other thing is the fruit phenotype um, is inconsistent when planted from seed uh, from F1 to F2. So F1, F1 is just something that we use, that we refer to with genetics. F1 is that first generation, F2 is that second generation. If you were to do a Punnett square, um, you know, your, your other columns would be F1 and F2, and that's how you would show the next generations. Um, phenotype refers to the physical characteristics of the fruit. Um, so if I were to take a bite from an apple, let's say it was a Macintosh or a Cortland, um, and I took the seed and I, you know, planted it in a pot and I germinated it and I planted it outside, and eventually it would bear fruit. It would not be Macintosh or Cortland. It would be something different. What would happen would be that that Macintosh, let's say that I, that seed from that Macintosh that I planted would cross-pollinate. Uh, it's the previous generation, uh, there was cross-pollination in order to make that happen. Um, and so that seed would not produce that Macintosh. So each generation you get a phenotypic change. Um, now it's possible to predict what that is if you can control the pollination in a setting. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we don't propagate apples um, in a horticultural setting uh, from seed. Uh, we, we propagate them asexually um, because of that variance. Um, and so there's a couple of different propagation uh, strategies that we'll talk about in a minute. But um, so in terms of the trees in your backyard, it's hard to say how they got there uh, because that's something that a lot of people ask. Um, it could have gotten there intentionally. It could have been planted by, uh, you know, previous owner of your home uh, who, who actually bought a seed, or I'm sorry, a seedling, a whip uh, that was produced uh, properly. So it could be a, 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 you know, a good cultivar, a desirable cultivar. Um, it could have been planted from, 
you know, wild seed from nearby apples. Um, or it could have been planted, you know, way early on uh, before someone was, you know, before uh, folks were really practicing proper horticultural uh, practices. Um, so it's any number of things that could, that could be the case. But not all fruit that comes from, um, uh, you know, apple seeds are inherently bad. It just means that you just don't know what they're going to be. Um, and you do lose flavor, you do lose texture, um, you know, with hybridization. Uh, so um, it's just something to keep in mind. Oh, one more thing I'll mention. This is a, my first Arboretum pluck. Get ready. If you're interested in seeing uh, Malice Silver Sigh, uh, you can come over to the Arboretum. One is a heritage orchard where there's multiple different types of heirloom varieties and there's many heritage orchards around thanks to people like John Bunker. Um, but uh, if you're interested in seeing that original variety, uh, it's at the Arboretum, uh, so come by and check it out. It doesn't produce fruit, um, but uh, it's still really cool to see. <clears throat> okay, um, so grafting and budding. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and uh, some of the things that you can uh, think about uh, if you'd like to uh, do some propagation. Now, whenever you buy a whip from Abishan Hardware or a you know, local nursery, uh, that whip is the product of a graft. Uh, you can look at the base of the, of the whip and you can see the scar um, from where the graft occurred. Um, it, it, it'll almost look sort of like a, you'll see a notch, you know, you'll see the original rootstock and then you'll see sort of a, a in some cases, a, an outcropping from there and then a new leader. Um, and so what that is, is a union uh, between scion wood and rootstock. And that's really what, um, what grafting and budding are. Um, so, uh, two, and this is, by the way, grafting and budding are forms of asexual propagation. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, so there's a couple of uh, grafting practices I'll talk about today, um, but you, there's sort of a couple of objectives that we're looking for uh, when, we're, when we're grafting. The first one is, uh, if I want to add new varieties to already established trees, uh, such as what I'm, what's featured over here, um, and you can see, I mean, and there's fables about this and, you know, sort of like, uh, especially here in Maine, uh, in, you know, uh, of folks with, you know, 15 or 20 varieties on one tree. Um, you know, the practical purpose of that, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's, it's cool. Um, it's, it's certainly very neat and an, an amazing conversation piece uh, at the barbecue. Um, but uh, practically speaking, that is not the most common uh, place that you see grafting. Um, so that's, that's one, one way you can do it. Um, now, a, a, a potential way that you might use uh, a cleft graft, which is, is what I'm referring to here and what you're seeing in this, um, this photo, is you have a great tree uh, really established roots, super old, uh, nasty windstorm comes and splits the tree in half and you lose, you know, several large branches. And so you're left with this, you know, beautiful rootstock and maybe one functioning branch and you say, well, I gotta, you know, I gotta bring this tree back. Uh, why sacrifice the whole tree? Um, and so you'll, you'll do a cleft graft in order to introduce uh, maybe some other varieties or try to rescue that tree. Um, so cleft graphing we'll talk about, and then also creating new trees or whips uh, for field planting. And we call that a whip and tongue graft. Um, and those are often done not in the field. Those are done, you know, they're often referred to as bench grafts. You'll do them like indoors in your garage um, at this time of year. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, Something to say about grafting budding, there's tons of different techniques and each technique refers to sort of where you're introducing that scion wood to the rootstock. Um, but the key thing to remember is rootstock and scion wood. Scion wood is gonna produce the fruit, uh, you know, that you want. Um, so you'll take the scion wood from the, from the tree with the, the fruit that you want to propagate. Your rootstock 
um, is not going to have uh, fruit that's, you know, that great. Um, so you're introducing the scion wood to the rootstock, um, and that's, you know, that's the technique in general. But, you know, you can look up, there's tons of different grafting approaches um, and, you know, different places. Budding refers to literally taking a bud of the scion wood, a fruit bud, and introducing it to um, rootstock. So there's lots of different techniques. We're only going to talk about two today. Um, just in this setting, it's hard to, to really like, there's no point in going through each one. Um, but uh, depending on what you want to do, um, you know, look, you know, do some, do some research. Um, <clears throat> the two, or not two, the three um, helpful hints that I'll mention with grafting. Keep track of your scion wood and your rootstock wood um, because you can make a very common mistake um, and mix them up. Even when you're when you're doing your graft, you know you'll you'll have you'll be in your bench in your workshop and you'll you'll have this great scion wood that you got uh, you know from this neighborhood farm who was nice enough to let you go you know help yourself. Um, and then you get the rootstock, which you probably bought online from Fedco, and you're you know you're doing your bench grafting and and then you get about halfway through and you look down and you, you can't quite remember which is scion and which is rootstock. Um, and you realize that you mix them up and you made this sort of horrible mistake um, and you're not sure anymore. So uh, labeling your scion wood and your rootstock wood so that you know where it is and kind of keeping it in the same place on your workbench um, if you're doing some bench grafting is uh, advisable. Disease management starts um, with your tools. It starts with keeping a clean house. Uh, and I don't mean that like a house, but I mean like clean your equipment, uh, sanitize your bypass printers and your hand printers, um, you know, pay attention uh, to disease uh, management. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, and then also habit of growth, which we'll get into later. Um, just going to check my time here because, you know, I'm a little rusty on some of my instructional practices and I just want to make sure I'm not losing track of time. Okay, great. Okay. So um, this first one is the cleft graft. And this one is kind of what I referred to earlier when I was talking about uh, getting multiple varieties um, on a tree. Um, so you know, it, this particular image says, you know, changing a tree from red delicious to honey, to honey crisp. And, um, you know, you sure you could do that, but, um, but yeah, so this is the technique. You can see that scion wood there. Um, you can see those fruiting clusters here. Uh, basically you make an angled cut, um, you know, using an ultra sharp knife, um, exposing this cambium layer, which is that, that green tissue um, it's actually, you can see it really well here. And that cambium layer, by the way, is where most of the food, um, where the uh, xylem and phloem tissue um, of woody plants exists. That, that cambium layer is where the food is moving, where the sap is moving, um, sending, uh, you know, raw materials up to the leaves, uh, you know, to undergo photosynthesis and then sending starch back down. Um, imagine, you know, thousands of small microscopic straws all uh, pressed together. Uh, that's what the cambium layer is. Now, why does the cambium layer matter? Uh, well, because you need to make sure that the cambium layers match up. And that's the case with all grafting, all grafting of any kind. Uh, the goal is to make sure that you have a union between the cambium on the scion wood and the cambium on the rootstock. Um, if you're successful in that, then you will have a proper union. Um, so this, uh, particular cleft graft, um, and again, it all comes down to the technique, but, you know, you're making an incision on the bark in order to expose that cambium layer, which is just under the bark. Um, and then you have that scion wood, which you can see with that cut, um, it's almost kind of like an angle, um, a wedge of sorts. And you basically insert it, um, and then, you know, you can use, uh, you know, they have grafters tape, which, you know, you would, you would, you know, uh, 
pull around, or you can also use wax, which is what's recommended in this um, particular diagram. And the key here uh, is keeping out air and moisture. Um, so that's the cleft graft. Um, time of year to do this, well, right about now, um, when you're when the trees are beginning to leave dormancy, um, you know, as temperatures rise above freezing, which they are today, um, you know, woody plants, um, you know, begin to send up, uh, you know, sap up, you know, through the, through the base of the tree, through the cambium layer and, up, and start pushing uh, up towards the leaves or what will soon be leaves towards those buds. Um, and so that process um, is happening now. And so you're going to get the most uh, success doing that graft in that March to April window um, before those buds have swollen um, and opened up. So this next one is the second, and this is the whip and tongue graft, um, sometimes referred to as a bench graft uh, because you will, you know, you would do it on well a bench. Um, no need to do this in the field. Um, and this particular diagram isn't as good as the previous one. Uh, this came from the North Carolina State um, Cooperative Extension, who has a, a bunch of great resources on grafting. Um, but basically, uh, on that rootstock, uh, you've got uh, you know an angled cut, one to two inches in length, um, and then an incision, um, and then you know the scion. And you know sometimes uh, the whip and tongue can can be as simple as just you know, two angled surfaces meeting, uh, but more experienced grafters will create that tongue so that scion can actually sit right into it. Um, again, difficult to show in this, in this setting. Um, and then, you know, a, a wrap of some kind, uh, you know, in order to seal that up. Um, and then these whips are prepared, um, you know, can be prepared indoors in a, in a head house or something like that. Um, and then, you know, put out in, in, you know, in burlap pots, um, you know, for a couple of years until they're ready for, for nursery market. So um, those are two, you know, general grafting techniques. I encourage you to, to look up, um, you know, more grafting uh, techniques, uh, you know, if you're, if you're interested in this. I think the cleft graft is, is the best place to start. Um, if you're looking to do grafting for the first time, um, it's easy to, to look it up and say, wow, there's you know, eight to 10 different types of grafting techniques. I don't even know what I need. Start with a cleft graft. It's nice and easy. Um, you know, go practice on that, on that old apple tree in your backyard. You know, take a scion, a cutting from one tree you know, on the other side of the lot and you know, bring it over to the other tree and see if you can you know, get that cambium layer exposed, that green tissue and see if you can match it up with, um, you know, the green tissue of, of the rootstock plant and see if it takes. Um, it's a low risk opportunity to try something new. Um, so a varietal selection, um, as I said earlier, you know, John Bunker, Fenco Trees, um, you know, those are the guys to be, to be talking to in terms of, of varieties. Um, and John is, is incredible because, you know, he's able to look at you look at this fruit and really identify it, you know, based on its, its color and its, you know, its, its size and, and things like that. Um, I don't, I can't do that. <laughs> um, so it's really incredible to see, to see him do this. And, um, but uh, in terms of varietal selection, let's say you, you decide that you want to plant some trees this year. Um, you know, you're going to plant, um, you know, a handful of trees in, in the backyard. Um, here are a few things to think about uh, when you think about varietal selection. And this is going to matter when we're talking about pruning, by the way. Um, you know, when we're talking about the characteristics of the tree themselves, you know, with multiple different sizes to choose from, uh, you know, you're from dwarf to you know, upright to semi-dwarf. Uh, semi-dwarf are my preferred uh, because it's, you know, easy access for fruit, easy to harvest, easy to prune. Um, older farms, um, you know, well, you'll see these more standard size trees, 20 to 25 feet, um, give lots of fruit um, and just sort of the old staples. Um, some things to think about, your habit of growth, right? So that's this right here. The ease of harvest, 
Um, it does matter. Uh, it, it makes a big difference because nobody likes working on a ladder. Um, so if you can, uh, that's why these dwarf and semi-dwarf trees are often preferred um, for new plantings because you can, you know, you can really keep them accessible. Cold hardiness um, and then pest uh, resistance and, you know, disease and insect resistance <laughs> um, is a significant, uh, a significant factor. Um, in many cases, things like apple scab, you can find varieties that are resistant um, if you take the time to do the research. And then of course, all the basic characteristics of fruit, um, you know, taste, color, fragrance, um, you know, shelf life, how well it holds. Are you gonna use these apples for cooking, for fresh, e uh, fresh eating, uh, for cider, for, for agricultural feed, you know, feeding your goats or pigs or whatever. Um, the timing of the ripening, um, you know, is it a late September finish or is it a November or December finish like Black Oxford, um, the, you know, the infamous purple uh, apple um, that, that folks are always talking about. And that, that ripens in November, December. So, um, so that's always a great choice. Um, and then of course, now more than ever, people are so interested in the history and cultural significance um, of apples and the stories that, um, that they come with. Um, you know, Northern Spy is an example of that. Uh, we had a, North, a couple of Northern Spy uh, planted um, on, on the, or in the orchard on Islesboro where, where I taught. Um, it was always an interesting one. Um, it's a very old fashioned American variety. It's got um, nice color to it, you know, sort of red, orange hue. Um, it's a good winter apple, so it stores well. Um, I think it's great for fresh eating and for cooking. Um, and it's, it's sort of like a mid fall harvest. Um, but it's kind of really fascinating story, um, which is why I brought it up, especially in today's context. You know, Northern Spy, what, what a lot of people believe about this, this apple is that it references the, the abolitionist um, uh, who was sort of responsible for a big part of the Underground Railroad. And uh, basically, uh, this aboli abolitionist uh, would, uh, from, from the north, would travel south um, and represent uh, himself as a, as a slave catcher. Um, but turns out, and so he would go to these, these plantations and he would present himself um, as a slave catcher and would ask to interrogate uh, the, the, the enslaved people. Um, and then when he was alone with them, he would tell them that actually he was there to help them escape. Um, and he would communicate to them, uh, you, know, the, you know, the locations of these, of these houses where they could stay um, as they journeyed north. Um, so, uh, you know, all of these apples have really fascinating stories, um, especially up here in New England. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know what's true and what isn't, but it still, it still makes for a really interesting conversation. Um, if you're looking for another great resource, uh, Orange Pippin um, is, a, is an incredible site uh, that lists many, many different varieties. Um, so if you're, you know, you want to read about some of the different varieties or, you know, try to identify what you have, um, uh, that's a great resource. Okay, pruning. Pruning, yes, it's, um, it can be intimidating and uh, a little scary because, uh, of course, folks are always worried that they're going to somehow damage the tree. Um, this is a beautifully tr pruned tree. Um, what I would describe as an open center uh, configuration. Um, you can see that there, at least from this, this particular angle, it doesn't really look like there's a main leader to this tree. It looks like there's multiple leaders sort of fanning out in an umbral fashion. Um, and so I would describe this as open center and the one in the back too. Um, so, so what are our objectives for pruning? Um, well, um, some of them are pretty obvious, um, airflow and light. Uh, now light, we know why we need light, um, you know, leaf production, chlorophyll production, um, you know, larger fruit, more ripe fruit. Um, it's just necessary. Um, airflow though, airflow is key to disease management. Um, 85% of plant diseases are fungal. Most diseases are fungal. Um, they are not bacterial, they're fungal. 
And what do fungus need to survive? They need, you know, a food source, they need moisture. Um, and so those high humidity environments where, where moisture isn't moving um, can create, you know, these opportune envi environments for things like scab, apple scab uh, to, to proliferate. Um, An apple scab is a fungal disease. Um, and so, you know, we want to, you know, decrease that airflow. And um, so that's a big part of why we prune. We remove dead and diseased limbs. Uh, you know, the key there is obviously productivity. Um, let's say a quotation on the other end of that. Uh, and then control habit of growth. Now training systems for easy access. Um, and that's much more difficult depending on where you are. In many cases, when I prune, I, I don't really feel like I get a choice of the, the training system. You know, there's this implication like, you know, you go to prune and you're, you say, well, that's, I'm going to make this a, a central leader. Or I'm going to make this an open center. Usually you don't have a choice. It's already been established. You get to decide training systems when you get, when you plant your, your whips. That's when you get to decide year one, two, and three. After that, the decision's already been made and you're just cleaning up the mess. Um, so training systems, we'll talk about those in a few minutes, but, um, those are something that you want to keep in mind when you prune as, as you approach the tree, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what kind of training system is already here? And then you want to work to that. Now, when do you prune? Well, now, now is a great time to prune. Um, and that's part of the reason why I chose this, uh, topic because this is, this is the time to prune, um, some folks start as early as late February um, and conclude, uh, you know, in, in March and April, um, early April. But the, the big thing you want to avoid is, is excessive pruning when the buds have swollen. Um, and you can actually see, um, you know, those buds starting to, to swell um, and turn green. And that's when you're like, oh, okay, like I need to finish this up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you certainly, when those buds open, you, you want to be done um, and, and wrapping things up. Um, so overall, when we prune, our goal is to try to increase the abundance of fruit clusters. Apple trees produce fruit on second year and older wood. So the goal is to reduce herbaceous growth, reduce the overall volume of leaves <laughs> um, and leafy growth on the plant, and encourage older growth, woody growth, uh, where you're gonna find those fruit clusters. Um, so that's, those are the objectives for pruning. Um, and in general, you never wanna remove more than a third of the tree in one sitting. So, and I didn't put that on the slideshow and I should have, that was a mistake. Um, you know, more than a third, uh, you, you, you risk damaging uh, the tree, especially if you're seeing, and, and this is what we encounter now, maple producers, who, who kind of go through the same thing at this time of year, you know, it's, it's maple sap, you know, maple syrup production and apple tree pruning, uh, for, you know, for agriculturalists right now. And the, the variance, the climate variability, the weather variability that you see can, per, can produce hazards during pruning because you're shocking the tree. And if you have that, that massive flux in temperature and, and, you know, the tree could leave dormancy. Um, so we talk about that, but. So when you first approach the tree, um, you know, there's an opportunity to uh, kind of, before you even get into shaping and, you know, thinking about your cuts and everything, uh, there's a lot of easy stuff that you can do. Um, and you can do this and then just walk away if you want. Um, this is like the easy stuff. Um, you know, crisscrossing branches, they're, you know, they're not gonna be productive and you're gonna end up losing both broken branches, dead branches, diseased branches. Um, and then, you know, suckers growing from the base. And then oftentimes you'll also see those, those uh, suckers uh, growing, you know, from uh, maybe that first scaffold, um, you know, in the center of the tree. And you want to remove those as well. A lot of times you'll see suckers coming from the junction where the graft was, um, which is down here. And again, you see that swollen, which they actually represent pretty well in this. Um, that swollen uh, part of the tree is where the, where the junction is. Um, so after you've kind of done those easy cuts um, and removed all the dead growth and all the things that are sort of obvious, 
uh, then you'll begin uh, making one of two types of cuts, a heading cut or a thinning cut. Heading and thinning cuts um, are, this language is common throughout horticulture, horticulture and used to describe other types of pruning, um, rhododendrons, lilacs, whatever. Um, but in the, uh, for apples, uh, a heading cut, uh, the goal is to take off some of that first year growth, or this year's, it would be last summer's growth, last su spring, summer, falls growth, and to bring that back. So you can see on this diagram here, you know, I've got a branch here. Um, you know, this might be, you know, first year, second year wood. You know, I'm making a cut here because I don't want that that new growth to continue. And you can see if you look at an apple tree that's been neglected, you know, you'll see kind of the shape of the tree, the, those main leaders. And then at the top, you'll see, you know, endless water sprouts kind of going from the top. All of those things should have been headed back. So now you're in this place where you have to go out and top the tree, which isn't the best practice, but you kind of have to at that point. The purpose of heading is to create a stockier build on the tree. You don't want the, the tree to get sort of leggy. You, you start getting too many branches and the branches start to fall and you just don't want it. Um, so heading, you know, reduces that, that legginess um, it, and it releases basically this oxen uh, when you make that cut, the, the plant is, is sort of triggered. It's like, oh, you wounded me. Um, and then immediately from that cut, um, because you've eliminated that meristem, there's going to be two or three shoots that will come out from there. Um, so a heading cut is, is a great opportunity to control the size of the tree, but also to create new growth. If you look at trees that have been really well pruned over many years, you know, especially your semi-dwarf trees, you'll see a really stocky tree and they'll be loaded with fruit clusters. And they'll be, the fruit clusters will be like every few inches along the, along the branch. You're like, how did you do that? And it was frequent, persistent heading back um, and keeping those branches uh, narrow. Um, and then of course your thinning cut, uh, which is the removal of a whole branch. Um, and that, your thinning cuts, the problem with thinning cuts is in many cases you are removing fruit clusters when you do this. So thinning cuts are more about shaping uh, the leaders, deciding kind of how you want the tree to be progressing, uh, removing those dead and diseased limbs, uh, but really shaping the overall tree um, and deciding what branches are gonna go the distance for you. Um, and heading is more of about triggering, you know, eliminating first uh, most, your most recent uh, growth, your, your last season growth. Um, so in general, those are the two cuts that you'll make. Um, some folks say it's easier to thin first, um, and then do your heading cuts. Obviously, if you spend a bunch of time heading back, um, then you step back and you say, well, I've done all this heading back, but you know what, that branch, that branch, and that branch need to go. Uh, you've sort of wasted your time doing the heading back because you'll end up cutting the tree anyway, or cutting the branch anyway. Um, so, so I like to go in and do all the easy stuff, which is what I showed you in the last slide, the, the dead, diseased, um, the, the water sprouts, all my thinning cuts, take a step back, say, okay, what's this, the shape of this tree and what do I want it to be? Do some thinning and then go, go in and do my heading cuts. Um, that's kind of my approach, but everyone kind of has a different way of, of doing it. Um, and you can see here in this photo, you know, we make those 45 degree cuts when we prune. Um, one, it's to encourage water to run off the cut. If it's a flat cut, the water might land, pool, and cause rot. rot. Um, so 45 degrees. The other thing you have an opportunity to do, and this is really when, uh, for heading cuts or heading back, you have an opportunity really to shape the future growth of the tree because where you make that cut, that bud, if it's a vegetative bud, in other words, a non-fruiting bud, um, then that, that bud will likely produce um, a branch in the angle to which the bud is oriented. So by making a cut here, I'm basically choosing to create a branch going in this direction, which is kind of nice to be able to do that. Um, so when I make my heading cuts, I often want to keep in mind that if I have buds that are facing 
to the inside of the tree, those buds could eventually become branches that are growing in the wrong direction. No point in keeping those because in two or three years, they're gonna be a problem. So I often try when I'm heading back to keep an eye out on where the buds are oriented. Um, but you also don't have to. I mean, that's, that's kind of being obsessive about, about it. Um, you know, you don't have to go to that level of detail. Um, and sometimes when I talk about pruning, you know, I, I struggle between, you know, how much detail to go into to give people tools, but also not want to make it seem like a bigger deal than it is so that folks get scared off and they don't, they don't take care of their tree because they're worried they're going to they're gonna damage it or something. Um, worst case scenario, you know, you're going to have a funny looking tree. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So we talked about training systems. So, you know, when you're thinking about the, the order of thinking, right, you're dead and diseased limbs. That's the first thing I mentioned. And that's the thing. If you do nothing else, do that. Go out and cut the dead stuff off. Um, your next level of thinking is your heading cuts and your thinning cuts. While you're doing all of that work, you want to kind of keep an eye to the, the training systems. And there are many different types of training systems, but most of them fall within these three. Um, the open center or open vase uh, configuration. And again, you've got the main branch here, the main leader, I should say, um, with several branches come off, coming off of one scaffold. Okay, so we call these scaffolds. Um, but with an open center configuration, you, you tend to have one scaffold and multiple branches coming from that in the shape of an umbrella or an umbral. The modified central leader, which, you know, you sort of have like a, a main leader kind of <laughs> uh, with a couple coming off and you can see the scaffold here and here and here or central leader, which is a really pronounced, um, you know, main leader. It'll be obvious that there's one leader. And then here you can th see three scaffolds. Now I'm using the word scaffold for the first time because when you're training, okay, and we're talking about thinning cuts at this point, when you're training these trees, uh, you really want to keep in mind of eliminating branches that don't exist within a scaffold. Um, you know, sometimes you get those random branches that are kind of growing in the middle there. Um, those are not great. Uh, those could potentially damage the tree. Um, you can leave them on, but uh, we try to encourage folks to, to keep things to, to you know, sets. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Okay, yeah, so I, I think I see why I put this in here. So um, this is formative pruning. Um, I think I put this in here really to demonstrate the new wood um, and, and older wood concept. Um, so, you know, you might have your main trunk here and then, you know, some lateral growth. You know, you make that cut there. There's that outward facing bud. That outward facing bud um, eventually becomes another branch. Now you're going to find your fruit clusters. This is only a, a year three tree, but you know, your first fruit clusters are going to occur on this two year old wood. So this wood right here is, is this season's wood. All right, let's say it's fall. This is what grew this spring and summer. This is what grew last spring and summer. And this is what grew the previous spring and summer. Your first fruit clusters are going to occur here. So we head back because we want to increase the abundance of old wood relative to the abundance of new wood. If we let our trees get too leggy, we're not, we're going to have a very vegetative tree. It's going to be filled with beautiful leaves, <laughs> which is fine. Um, unless you're, you know, planning on having apple pie. So, um, and then this picture right here, and there's some great pictures online, uh, of, you know, what an apple, uh, tree bud looks like, uh, or I'm sorry, fruit bud looks like, but um, you tend to see a swollen uh, sort of cluster, um, which is sort of demonstrated here, uh, with a couple of flower buds 
uh, coming off of that cluster. Um, those are your fruiting buds and you wanna do your best to save those. Um, now you're gonna cut some of those when you prune. So just accept it, um, especially if it's a neglected tree, you know, you're gonna have to make some sacrifices uh, in order to get that tree back to where you want it to be. Um, and in many cases in commercial settings, too many uh, fruit buds are discouraged because it's weighing down the tree. Um, also too many fruit buds in close, uh, you know, close by, cl uh, you know, next to each other uh, can create a situation where you have fruit growing on top of each other. You get smaller fruit, uh, which is also less desirable. Um, so as you prune, you kind of want to be aware of where your fruit buds are um, and where your leaf buds are. Leaf buds tend to occur sort of in, um, in singular or like right next to each other um, in an alternate fashion along the branch. Uh, your fruit buds will have a sort of a cluster and you'll actually see the scar tissue um, right around that bud. So uh, transitioning to uh, insect and disease challenges, um, apples and really other tree fruits, uh, palm fruits are a little bit of a gr grammatical issue here, present significant insect and disease challenges for farmers and gardeners. Um, the biggest issue, I think, um, you know, we talk about perennials, um, and perennials are encouraged, um, especially in a lot of the things we're hearing about with permaculture and biodynamic farming. Um, you know, per, uh, perennials are great, but you sort of lose this opportunity to start fresh every season. Um, oh, my tomatoes didn't do well um, in this spot. Uh, there was plenty of hornworm and uh, fusarium wilt. I'm gonna do them in pots next year on the other side of the house. Um, great, don't have disease problems. Uh, the issues with apples is that, you know, you, you don't have that option. Um, so that's a big issue. Um, apples present, you know, all sorts of pest pressure. You know, you've got birds, you've got deer, you've got a variety of wildlife, you've got insect pressure, um, and of course, disease pressure. So I want to just kind of plug IPM um, for a moment. IPM is sort of the industry term uh, for what, uh, you know, how to approach pest management. Um, it's a process of thinking. Uh, it is not a silver bullet solution. IPM is the law for schools. It's the law for towns and municipal governments. It's the law for public lands. Um, so IPM is the sort of sanctioned approach to dealing with pests. And by the way, we define pests as unwanted uh, organisms. So it could be, you know, someone's pest is another person's pet. Um, you know, the cat preying on my bird feeders is a pest for me, but it's someone's best friend. Um, so IPM is a process and you can read all about IPM. Um, the big thing I say is if you really wanna hold your, your schools accountable uh, for, um, their chemical use, uh, particularly, you know, pesticides and herbicides, uh, call them and ask them who their school's IPM coordinator is. Ask them that one question, because it's an important question to ask. Um, a lot of times in Maine, you, you know, you get a small school, there's a couple of custodians, um, and they decide to go out and, you know, spray Roundup on the pavement, um, and then all the kids come out and play because they don't know any better. Um, in Maine, uh, public lands, which inc includes schools, um, it is illegal to spray any chemical on public lands unless you're a certified and licensed uh, pesticide applicator. Um, and that was a process I went through to get that license um, and had to go to the state and do all the testing. Um, but it's something to know because it matters. Um, you don't want people spraying even what folks consider to be organic chemicals um, in spaces unless you know they, they really understand because even your organic herbicides your organic um, pesticides can cause harm to pollinators and they can cause harm to small children so 
Uh, we just want to be aware. But the, the five major stages of IPM, you know, identification and monitoring, um, you know, what's wrong with the plant? <laughs> Uh, what's wrong with the fruit? Um, am I seeing uh, dechlorination? Um, you know, are, am I seeing damage to the fruit? Am I seeing, um, you know, uh, damage to the tree? Um, evaluation. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually action and monitoring. Um, and record keeping is a big part of that as well. Um, so you sort of follow this this track, um, and it's an ongoing process of keeping an eye on the trees. Um, there's a lot you can do ahead of time, um, even if you're an organic farmer or gardener. Um, so here's a few insects and diseases you'll likely contend with. Um, of course, over here, a photo of apple scab, which is uh, one of the most common uh, diseases that you'll find on apple trees in Maine. Any of the wild types uh, that you'll see on the side of the road are likely going to have issues with scab. Um, it's uh, it's mostly an aesthetic problem. You know, it's it's not like you couldn't take that and cut the scab off of it and you know eat the other the other parts of it um, or use it for cider or cooking. Um, but it's definitely it's definitely not appetizing. Um, so let's talk about a couple of key things to remember um, with pest control. First, young trees. So you got a big, you know, backyard lot, big field. Uh, maybe it's mowed once a year um, in the fall for hay, and you decide that you want to convert a quarter of it uh, to an orchard. So you go out, you plant your whips in the spring. Weed control is going to be key um, in those initial years. That's sort of obvious. Um, competition for water, competition for light um, in those spaces right away, you're going to want to be vigilant for deer, which is obvious, and I didn't mention that in here, but everybody knows about deer here in Maine and what we have to do for that. Uh, fencing is the best way to deal with that. Um, you know, some, uh, you know, metal chicken or poultry fencing, you know, you know, create a, you know, a nice wide area around the tree so that they can't, because um, they're trying to get to the cambium too, right? Uh, they, they're trying to rip back that bark and get to that sweet sugar that's in the cambium. Um, so that's why they're, they're attacking the trees. Um, so deer protection, yes, um, but round-headed apple borer, um, an insect pest which is just devastating uh, trees across Maine and New England right now as we speak. Um, it is becoming, it's working its way up. Um, I believe it's, I believe it's an Asian, um, for, from, from Asia, um, it's basically, um, an insect that bores it at the base of a tree. Um, again, trying to get to that cambium layer. Um, it'll go, uh, it'll sort of burrow in. You can actually see the burrow holes at the base of the tree. It will burrow in and work its way up the tree from the inside. Um, it's incredibly destruct destructive. And you see it in that first three to five years. They don't really, they don't really bug those small ones. There's just not a, a lot there for them. But once you get that tree, you know, in year two, three, four, five, um, they get really interested. Um, I think they burrow in June and July. They, they work their way up the tree uh, from the inside. The problem is, is you can't get to them. Uh, even if you want to use, if, if you're ready to, you know, you got that prize tree and you're ready to spray uh, with whatever you want, you know, <laughs> and you're willing to go there, um, you can't get to them. You have to time it out with when the when the insect is uh, laying its eggs. Um, so that's a big one worth, worth some consideration. Um, you can get them with coat hangers. I've seen people use coat hangers, uh, you know, just get down on your hands and knees and kind of stick the coat hanger in there and see if you can bludgeon them. Um, also painting the base of your trees uh, is another thing you can do uh, to, to sort of de, um, to create some, some mechanical barriers. Um, mixing uh, interior white latex paint with a little bit of water um, and painting the outside base of the tree three or four feet up from the ground um, is a great way to uh, prevent insect pests that like to burrow through the bark, but it's also useful for temperature regulation as well. Um, we put in, especially with younger trees, 
sometimes there are concerns about uh, the sun hitting, uh, you know, reflecting off the snow and artificially heating up the, the, the trees, uh, you know, during this time of year um, and causing them to bloom early. Um, and if they bloom early, um, there's a chance that there could be a petal drop and you won't get fruit that year. Uh, this happens all the time in Maine. There's, there's crop failure. Um, and that's one of them. So if you're concerned about that, you can paint the trees and, and help deal with that pest at the same time. Um, established trees, uh, you know, scab is the, 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 the one I mentioned. Um, wild trees are hosts for this disease. Um, so, you know, if you have a couple trees that you're planting or a tree that you prefer, you might want to get out there with a chainsaw and cut down some of those wild um, those wild types, because those uh, are likely hosts for scab. Um, now, disease resistant varieties is the way to go if you're planting a new orchard. Um, but in many cases, scab and some of these other fungal wilts and things like that, they live on in the understory of the tree, on the, at the literally on the grass and on the decomposing matter under the tree. And so in the spring, You'll get these, you know, you get your first heavy rain. So on a day like today, um, maybe like two or three weeks from now when it starts to really warm up, you get that first heavy rain and all of that leftover disease material from last season, the rotting apple that you didn't get, um, the leaves, bark, all of that is inoculum. And, it, and, and you get that first warm rain of the spring and you smell that rot in the air. And literally on the on the floor there are there is all of these these small structures these mycelium structures and they're literally projecting and shooting the disease inoculum into the canopy of the tree um and so if you are good and you're able to remove that disease material the previous season you can reduce the pre the prevalence of scab um but there are also physical barriers that, dish, that you can use as well uh, sulfur is a is a good treatment uh, for that, neem oil, um, botanical oils are, are commonly used by organic gardeners to try to reduce the presence um, of things like apple scab and other fungal diseases. Um, and then insect pests, I mean, there's a range of them, uh, codling moth, uh, you know, apple maggot, tent caterpillar, um, you know, they, you know, there's several approaches. I mean, you can go you know, into the more hardcore chemicals. They make full spectrum fruit tree sprays that you can buy, you know, Abish on hardware. Um, and you apply them multiple times, follow the instructions, um, and you'll pretty much, you know, be effective at, at dealing with the, um, the pest problems. Um, the problem with using those full spectrum uh, insecticides is, you know, there are potential risks to the, to the individual doing the spraying. Um, there's potential risks to the pollinators who you want, uh, who you need to be successful. Um, and then of course, there's just general concerns about toxicity in our environment. Um, pesticides uh, can fall under two categories. They can be, there, there's the toxicity um, and then how long they survive in the environment. Um, so if you want to look at it from a pesticide applicator standpoint, um, you know, choosing chemicals that are both low toxicity and have a low um, durability in the environment, meaning that they break down quickly, they wash away quickly, um, if you're, if you're going to go in that direction. Now, there are several great things you can do before you go and grab that heavy-duty, full-spectrum insecticide. Um, surround clay powder. Um, <coughs> very... Um, commonly used. It comes in a big bag. It's white powder um, and you literally toss it in the trees. Um, it creates this sticky coating which makes it really hard for disease inoculum, insect pests, basically anything that, that you're trying to prevent. Um, it kind of creates a physical barrier. Sticky traps, um, great for identification and for trapping insects. As you get into the chemical arena, BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiellus, um, is a commonly used um, uh, insecticide for caterpillars. Um, it's an anti-feedant. It gets in the gut of the insect 
and causes them to lose their appetite and they die. Um, BT is approved for organic use um, and it's more modern cousin, uh, spinosad uh, is another anti -feed, um Approved for organic use, um, but uh, still can pose risk to pollinators. Um, and then from there, you know, uh, permethrin uh, is sort of your first step into, um, you know, into the chemical territory. Um, most cases is not approved for organic use, uh, but if you know you're you're at that point where it's sort of uh, you you want to do something more serious, that's that's probably the first place you'll go. Um, general advice about pesticides um, and pesticide use: one, always wear protective equipment. Um, the big thing too is where you store your pesticides. Um, you know, you get the grandkids coming over. Okay, don't leave your pesticides sitting on the floor of your garage. Um, someone's gonna get hurt. Put the pesticides up on the counter, please. Uh, <laughs> up on a shelf, please. Um, it's really, really important that we keep uh, you know, children safe from this stuff because kids die all the time from pesticide consumption. Um, mixing it too, uh, where you mix it and you know, the containers you use to mix it. The other thing is the label. Um, you know, people toss out reading the label. Oh, read the label, read the label. The label is filled with great information. Um, how, not just how much to use, but also the frequency and when to spray. Um, we have something called a harvest interval. You don't want to spray, you know, most pesticides will say, well, this has a two week harvest interval, meaning don't spray this, you know, anytime within two weeks of eating this product. Um, something you definitely want to follow <laughs> um, if you're gonna if you're gonna go that direction but there's a lot of great things that you can do uh, before you venture into the into the chemical territory um, so some resources um, and references and additional reading um, I start with uh, here uh, the UMaine cooperative extension um, they recently updated their website they have all kinds of resources. I mean, this is really, this should be your first stop um, for, for anything. Um, they have something on every topic in gardening. They speak to home gardeners, but also commercial gardeners. Um, they have great clips uh, of, you know, extension professionals doing all of the things we've talked about today. Um, and I think we could, I might be able to find a way, Elizabeth, to share some of this stuff with you. Um, but you know, in general, um, the cooperative, cooperative extensions should be your go-to resources, um, especially here in Maine. We have a great cooperative extension. Um, they're great for you know advice and for clips and things like that. So be sure to check them out. And I think I think that's it. Well, as we covered, oh my gosh, it's four twelve. <laughs> I was worried. I was worried about that. Um, get going and I, I sort of lose track of time. Um, want to leave time for questions. So uh, if folks have questions um, about apples or other things, uh, even the Arboretum and Augusta, I'm happy to talk about that. <clears throat> Ryan, you have a question with Andrea? Okay. Um, thank you, Ryan, I enjoyed your talk. Actually, I have two short questions. Um, I, I know that most plants, most higher plants rely on mycorrhizal fungi in order to grow well. Do people who grow apple trees just rely on the mycorrhizal fungi that are already in the soil or do they add mycorrhizae when they grow their trees? Great. Yeah, I'm so glad that you, you brought that up. Um, and I'm ashamed for not having discussed it um, in this presentation already. Um, so I'm really glad that you brought that up, Andrea, thank you. Um, so mycorrhizal fungi are becoming much more popular um, amongst agriculturalists and especially orchardists. It's important that I back up a little bit and talk about the history of land plants um, and, and why this matters. Um, most relationships nearly all relationships uh, with plants and the soil exist with mycorrhizal fungi. Their role, they basically there's a long network within the soil 
a, a, a highway system where nutrients that are in organic form, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all these different things become available to plants due to the work of fungi. And these mycorrhizal fungi are responsible and, and basically inhabit the root zone of most plants, most land plants. And they are responsible for making those, those materials available. Um, now, why? Why do we need these relationships? Um, a lot of uh, natural history uh, folks, um, I, uh, it's uh, Botany in a Day. You gotta read Botany in a Day, um, which is this great book. Um, and he, um, he talks about the early history of plants. Um, and Body in a Day is a great book to read because it talks about easy ways to classify plants by their families. So if you're like not really into plant ID and you find plant ID overwhelming because there's hundreds of thousands of plants, you're like, how do I even scratch the surface of this? Botany in a Day is a, is a great way to do that. But in the beginning of his book, he talks about how we went from as a planet having plants in our oceans, maritime and aquatic plants, to land plants. And fungi are, the con are believed to have been the, the connecting tissue, so to speak, the connection between aquatic plants and marine plants and land plants. And those relationships exist today um, where, so, so yeah, so that's some, some broader context. Um, so Michael Phillips, is a farmer out in New Hampshire. And he wrote a book, which I guess is at the office, I'm home today, um, but it's at the office. Um, you're welcome to borrow it. He's amazing. Um, he has been pushing this thing called holistic orcharding. And it's all about creating beneficial mycorrhizal uh, relationships in the soil in order to encourage disease resistance. Um, and there's a number of things that he does that are really fascinating. Um, I'll mention two of them. One is creating piles of brush, um, you know, uh, evergreen brush, you know, under the tree in order to encourage the creation of these relationships, um, particularly, um, you know, cuttings of woody plants, um, you know, clean cuttings, you know, short, you know, stuff you push through a, a brush hog or a, a chipper. Um, and he believes that that creates these beneficial relationships and encourages them. Um, the other thing some folks are doing, and, and he, he, you know, pushes this as well, is in the early spring, he'll get out, he'll go out with his big backpack sprayer, and he kind of sprays these teas on his trees. And they're a combination of neem oil, botanical oils, um, compost tea, and um, basically mycorrhizal fungi that you can buy online, <laughs> you know, in a packet. And he sort of mixes all these things together and creates this, you know, this, this tea that he sprays. And again, it's all about encouraging these mycorrhizal fungi uh, for increased disease resistance. So my second question is, what's your favorite apple in an apple pie? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> You put me on the spot on that one. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was in an orchard once and uh, there was a, a, an argument between somebody who liked Max and somebody who liked Cortland's and we at, they asked the orchard person what they used and they said they used both varieties. Oh, that makes sense. Very diplomatic of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's important not to take a stand, you know, especially with the, the Mac and Cortland debate in Maine. Uh, those being our two biggest varieties. Um, uh, my neighbor here, um, he grows a bunch of great apples um, and he, he's been bringing them over to us and I'm really grateful for that. My wife loves Pink Lady, which is this like, you know, supermarket, you know, apple, it's, it's nothing fancy. And she, she buys a lot of those. Um, uh, but yeah, there's so much to choose from, um, but I appreciate the question. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And then we can um, maybe see, have more questions. And, and I was just wondering if uh, those pruning techniques that you told us, would those work for high bush um, blueberries? <laughs> uh, 
That I'm not sure. I, I think that the heading and thinning cuts probably apply. Um, I'm not so sure about some of the other techniques, um, uh, you know, particularly like the, the uh, training systems, for example, um, you know, probably wouldn't apply. Um, I know with high bush blueberries, um, I, I, I'm not sure how many main stems folks try to get that, that plant down to. Um, so I, I think if I wanted to learn more, that would probably be the first thing that I would try to figure out is, is there a central stem with, you know, lateral branches coming off of that? Um, you know, uh, yeah. So somewhat, I mean, the heading and thinning, that's, that's ubiquitous language used throughout horticulture. Um, and so, you know, I would start with that, you know, figuring out how many, you know, is there a lot of heading back on a high, high bullish blueberry? Or, or are there more thinning cuts, for example? Mm. Thank you. Oh, Chuck has a question. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask about the timing of pruning. I usually have always started in mid-February uh, or later. This year, since I was anticipating a uh, short of working span ability. I started early. I started in, uh, uh, well, probably in January. There was still snow on the ground, both with blueberries and, uh, and apples and pears. Uh, is there a harm in pruning too early? I guess that's my main question. Yeah, um, I've gotten a lot of questions about that. Um, I've started pruning as early as early January. Um, just sometimes I know that it's going to take me longer, like I have a busy spring planned. Um, and so I'll start picking away at it in January. Um, I think there's a couple things that could potentially happen. Um, one, like a lot of pruning followed by a warming spell could trigger the plant to leave dormancy. Um, but if you didn't see the buds greeting over earlier than your neighbor's buds, um, then you're probably fine. Um, there is the potential uh, if you do a, an aggressive prune, um, you know, followed by a deep cold, there's also the chance of, of some, you know, sort of winter damage that could be caused by, because, you are, you know, the tree is going to respond to this pruning, um, you know, so there is the potential that there could be some damage, but you know, a lot of orchardists are starting in mid January, um, especially large commercial orchards. Like they have to start early. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, Louis. Hi Ryan, really nice talk. I got a lot of good information from it. I've been, pruning an apple tree for about 30 years, not knowing what I'm doing. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and it's not in too bad a shape. But the question I have though is about rootstock, dwarf apple rootstock, are they hardy in Maine? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of different rootstocks that you can look into. Um, M19, which is a Russian derived um, and you know, that I believe is a semi-dwarf rootstock. Um, those, those are hardy. Um, there are several semi-dwarf roots, rootstocks that are hardy in Maine. Um, dwarfing rootstocks, I'm not as sure about that. Um, you know, you don't see that as prevalent either. Um, there's also the new, the, the pillier, uh, pillier, which I, I know very little about, to be honest with you. Um, and those are more like commercial settings where they basically prune the apple tree down to one liter um, with several sort of lateral branches. In some cases they're using trellising um, in order to support that, that tree. Um, I know very little about that. And those are used on dwarf rootstocks. Um, but you see those more in like California. Um, so to answer your question, um, I think there are many semi-dwarf rootstocks that are available. Um, that are that are hardy dwarfing. I'm not as sure. 
Thank you. I have a second question. Actually, it's a recommendation. Last yeah. year, the pest that I had to deal with, which really did a job on one of my apple trees, was a sap sucker. Mm. Almost, almost girdled the tree. How can I prevent that? Yeah, girdling is uh, a huge issue. Um, and the pain helps. Mm -hmm. Again, a physical, you know, physical deterrence. Um, if you don't want to do a targeted, uh, you know, targeted application of something like permethrin, um, you know, you can also buy, you know, tree collars um, and keep them very tight, um, tightly wound or like um, kind of the equivalent of poultry fencing. It's like a netting mm -hmm. um, and, you know, several layers of that um, so that, you know, again, it's, it's a, an issue to keep them away from, you know, girdling, physically girdling the tree. Um, and then, tar you know, targeted, targeted spraying, uh, if you want to go down that route. Okay, thank you. Yep. Ryan, we have just a few minutes left. Would you like to say anything about uh, the Arboretum? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, I'll mention, why don't I share my screen real quick? Um, is my conf here, let's do that. Folks, see my screen? Yep. Yep. So um, my role, um, what I do full time is um, I'm the executive director at Viles Arboretum in Augusta. Part of the reason why I got connected to this today. Um, if you haven't been to the Arboretum, I encourage you to come by. Um, it's a free resource. Uh, right in Augusta, we're right across the street from Riverside, um, and or I'm sorry, Riverview uh, Mental Health Hospital. Um, so we're on Hospital Street, 224 acres, um, over 20 botanical collections to see, um, lots to see. This is the property itself. I'll actually go full size on the map so you can really get a sense of, of what is here. Um, very accessible hiking trails, which is nice. Um, we have an outer loop and an inner loop trail and multiple tree collections uh, to see. Some of the ones worth noting are chestnut collections. We have two chestnut collections. One is um, the traditional American chestnut, uh, which we have on this side of the property down here. And that's for a seed collection. It's like a seed bank for us. Um, and then we have on the other side of the property, um, the hybridized chestnut collection, uh, which we've done a lot of work with uh, the American Chestnut Foundation, uh, the main chapter, and we have the largest planting of American chestnuts in the state, one of the largest in New England. Um, this is, there's 300 trees here that were recently planted. Um, so if you're interested in seeing chestnuts, um, you know, come by in July when they're flowering. Um, it's, it's very pretty. Um, there's several other collections. Maybe you can check out the apple and the apple tree collection that we have. Uh, we've got hosta garden, uh, lilacs, oaks, maples, um, native tree species, just a lot to see. Uh, green ash, uh, larch collections, nice wetland boardwalk, an old farm, old hospital farm. This whole land was owned by the hospital uh, back in the 1890s. The hospital, which, you know, was, is across the street over here, um, bought this land because they were principally concerned about water access at the time. So they bought all the farms and consolidated them all and built uh, basically an aqueduct um, to, to try to collect water. Uh, shortly thereafter, they started mining quarry granite um, on the property and then soon after built a built a farm um, and the prisoners worked. I, I say prisoners because that's what they were in 1890. They were prisoners. Um, they worked the farm um, as part of their therapy, uh, producing income uh, for the hospital. Uh, the piggery, uh, which is a historical site, can still be seen. The foundation of the piggery is, is still there. Um, and that's a very interesting site as well. Uh, so there's a lot to see here. Um, and my role as the director, um, you know, is, is primarily administrative, um, you know, dealing with 
fundraising and, you know, networking and our staff, we have a small staff, two, three people, um, a lot of volunteers, um, a visitor center uh, with, a, you know, children's room and several other things going on. Um, so this is sort of my, my shameless plug, uh, you know, if, if you're looking for something to do, um, you know, it's a, it's a great place for a walk, um, but it's also a great place if you're looking to get involved with volunteering or with membership or what have you, um, it's, it's great for that as well, so. Thank you. Well, Ryan, we'd like to thank you for giving your, us your time today. And uh, I think we all learned quite a bit. I certainly did. <laughs> so I, I, th I thank you for doing this. Um, it was my pleasure. It was so good to speak with all of you. Come by and visit, visit us at the Arboretum anytime. We're open Wednesday through Saturday, um, 11 to 5, and you can just drop by um, and, and say hi. I, I'd love to see you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, be well. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I can end it, actually.